Thanks, Mike. Thank you all for being here, and I'm excited to be able to introduce Congressman Salmon to you. Um, this guy's very special and uh, one of our great allies here. In the landmark year of 1994, Matt was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served three terms. During that time, he grew a reputation as being a watchdog, uh, a, 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 spend, a guy who went after spending, a real fiscal conservative. But in 2000, he, had, he remained true to his promise to, um, to uh, self-impose a term limit. So he, he went home and retired his seat. Uh, but after the passage of Obamacare, like a lot of conservatives, he started to rethink what he needed to do for the country. Um, at the same time, there was massive government regulation that was really crippling the economy in his district. Uh, so Matt, again, answered the call to serve. In 2012, he was reelected uh, to the House of Representatives, and we're pretty lucky that he was. Uh, Matt's a rock-solid conservative. He's the kind that we need more of. He's here for all the right reasons. <laughs> And he also has a lot of experience, having served those terms in the 90s. He's somebody that his colleagues can look to um, for some guidance and, uh, and to understand the history of the House of Representatives. This morning, Matt will talk to us about one of the big, important policies that we're unveiling today. Uh, the bill he'll talk to us about this morning is actually very simple. It would ensure that the American people have the ability to communicate with, another, with one another electronically without the government eavesdropping. <coughs> Very basic, but very important. It's in our communications with one another, after all, with our loved ones, our families, our friends, our colleagues, our customers, our competitors. It's in those communications that we share our ideas, we share our passions. And in so doing, we form those voluntary associations that form the bedrock of American civil society. A government that's big enough and willing to put a chill on these kinds of communications is a very dangerous thing for the health of a nation. Please join me in welcoming Matt Salmon to the podium to talk about how to address this problem. Well, it's really uh, wonderful to be here today. A wise man named Benjamin Franklin once said, those who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Now that uh, saying is so important to me that I had my wife etch it on my uh, wall in my congressional office. And this man was at the core of a generation that learned firsthand the cost of unchecked power. This experience gained the hard way, offered our founding fathers critical insights into how a government for and by the people ought to be held accountable. In their wisdom gained by experience, our founders specifically guaranteed the right of people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unwarranted search and seizures. Our founding's, founding fathers were not simple men, and they were certainly not ignorant or naive. And they understood that the challenges that we would have to face as a free nation, as a free state. They understood well, though, that without security, there is no liberty, and without liberty, there is no security. To strike this delicate balance between liberty and security, they instituted the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as the foundation for this new experiment in self-governance with maximum liberty being held to the highest ideal. Today we find ourselves in a fight of epic proportions as it relates to our individual liberties and their preservation. Day after day we see news story after news story chronicling the damaging effects of out-of-control surveillance state. In fact, last summer, Edward Snowden released a series of exposés revealing a series of surveillance programs such as PRISM, X-Keyscore, and Tempora, as well as the intercept interception of U.S. and European telephone metadata. These revelations raise serious questions about what we, the American people, were willing to trade for our security. Those who stood with me in defense of our Constitution, and particularly the Fourth Amendment to that Constitution, were accused of being naive, and we were accused of being ignorant by those advocates of mass snooping, saying, after all, what do you have to hide? Mass spying did not protect us from the Boston Ma Marathon bombers or the Christmas Day bomber. It didn't protect us from the Times Square bomber 
the shooting at an Army recruiter center in Arkansas, or the shooting at Fort Hood. In fact, when Deputy Attorney General James Cole was asked how many criminal cases have resulted from the use of this surveillance dragnet, he said, there may be one. In America's time of financial crisis, with billions of dollars being spent to support this gigantic secret snooping operation, a simple cost-benefit analysis of these programs would determine if they're effective enough to warrant mass amounts of funding that they receive. In fact, I could think of at least one far-flung consulate in Benghazi, Libya, that on the night of September 11, 2012, may have been in, able to use some of those resources. In a free country, there's a strong case to be made for the use of clandestine operations to help ensure the safety of its citizenry. Lawful covert surveillance programs provide critical, life-saving information to our servicemen and our service women defending us at home and abroad. We as American citizens understand that these operations, just as any other military offensive, must be targeted and well executed in order to be effective in saving the lives of our troops and innocent civilians. While the case can be made that secret operations may be necessary in order to save lives, a case for the lack of congressional oversight cannot. Transparency and privacy are the core of a republic. A republic demands transparency for the government and privacy for its citizens. Today, we reverse that with government demanding transparency from us, but insisting, insisting on secrecy for itself. One of my favorite philosophers, Frederick Bastier, in his treatise, The Law, said this, if the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it's not safe to permit people to be free, how is it that the tendencies of these organizers are always good? Do not the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the human race? Or do they believe that they themselves are made of a finer clay than the rest of mankind? Of course, there is a role for secrecy, but there must be a role for transparency. When you have secret courts and secret judges giving secret interpretations of a law to the point where its author can't believe how it's been misconstrued and then lie to the American people about it, we got a problem. And this problem could not have been more obvious to me as I sat in a classified congressional briefing that was being held in the wake of Edward Snowden's release of information about the NSA's secret spying programs. Now, in this briefing, members of Congress asked specific questions about the size and scope of these secret programs. Time and time again, the answers given by the NSA went something like, we're not going to disclose that, and don't worry, we've got it covered. Needless to say, our own government does not seem to think it important to tell the American people the truth. Last year, Senator Ron Wyden asked NSA Director James Clapper whether the NSA collected any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. Clapper, who was under oath, responded by saying, no, sir. We now know that this was a blatant lie. Furthermore, it cannot be ignored that the author of the Patriot Act, Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, has been quoted as saying on multiple occasions that Congress would never have passed or twice reauthorized the Patriot Act had it known the full breadth of the NSA snooping operation. The fact is, as usual, when you give the government an inch, they take a mile. We simply can't afford to play around with our most basic fundamental human rights. Back in May, before the revelations of Edward Snowden came to light, I introduced legislation to restore transparency, accountability, and confidence to our national security apparatus. H.R. 1847, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, is designed to increase protections for electronic communications, including personal emails of U.S. citizens, and addresses the privacy concerns raised from the recent position that the IRS took that the Fourth Amendment does not apply and does not protect the privacy of personal, unopened emails because Internet users do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in such communications. Clearly, there is a need to ensure the privacy of personal emails. In, a, in the ever-changing world of our technology, our laws must be updated to ensure our congressional our, excuse me, our constitutional rights are protected regardless of what mode of communication that we use. 
My bill requires the government to obtain a warrant or explicit written consent to read emails, text messages, or any other form of private electronic messaging. We have a duty to uphold the Constitution, the freedoms, and the rights it provides. And this bill is one way to achieve that responsibility. I'm proud to sponsor the House version of the Electronic Communications Privacy Amendments Act of 2013 because it will properly update the current version of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and affirm the fundamental right of every American in regards to their privacy. At times when we feel most betrayed by our own government, it can be all too easy to focus solely on it, label it as the problem, and ignore the many other real threats to our liberty that confront us on a daily basis. To maintain a proper perspective on those threats to our freedoms at home and abroad can be difficult. On one hand, it's imperative that we remain vigilant, focused and willing to confront our enemies wherever they may be. On the other hand, we've got to be careful not to forfeit the freedoms that we set out to defend in the first place in the name of temporary security. But I believe that we, are, as Americans, are up to the challenge. This challenge will require us to be educated, unintimidated, and something you probably don't see a lot here, reasonable. It will require us to act proactively and with precision rather than with ham-fisted emotional responses. My friends, never before has it been more important to stand and be counted among those who recognize that our natural rights are God-given, not given to us by any government. We've got to stand together, unintimidated, in defense of these natural rights to ensure that the founding ideals of our great nation survive for many, many generations to come. Our views are not born out of naivete or ignorance. Rather, they are born of a deep understanding of history and human nature and by the virtue of understanding. We, as independent, self-reliant Americans, maintain a healthy distrust for centralized power. We understand at the end of the day that we are free men and free women under God, and that our rights are not ours to give away. Thank you. Congressman Salmon is going to stay and uh, participate in our panel. And uh, if our panelists could come up now, uh, that would be great. We are going to spend a few minutes talking about this. Katie McAuliffe the Federal Affairs Manager and Executive Director for Digital Liberty at Americans for Tax Reform. And Paul Rosenzweig is a visiting fellow here in our Edward Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Um, and uh, we're excited to have them for this discussion. Um, so we'll open it up for questions in a few minutes. And uh, yeah, I think I'll join you all at the panel. Okay. Good. Um, we could start off, I think I'll direct a, uh, a question to Paul to start with. Um, Paul, talk to us a little bit about the constitutional history of, in this subject area so we kind of have that as a background. Well, uh, the Congressman rightly uh, pointed to the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution as the ground for our discussion of the ECPA Reform Act. Uh, the, the text of that protects American people's reasonable expectations of privacy. They protect them against unreasonable searches and seizures of their persons, houses, papers, and effects. The quintessential uh, ground for that amendment is the searching of private correspondence. The classic cases involved um, uh, uh, James Otis, who was a, a publisher and was the subject of search by uh, British authorities prior to the revolution uh, in an, in, under what were then known as general warrants, which are essentially orders uh, uh, to permit searches without any specificity, without a finding of probable cause. Um, these, this case and, and others like it were uh, widely known and famous throughout uh, the colonies at the time of the, of the founding and uh, formed the basis for the traditional historic suspicion of unchecked government authority to access your papers, your personal papers. Uh, if you would have asked any founding father uh, at the time of the framing, you know, what were the two classic things that were protected against intrusions without, by the government, by the Fourth Amendment, the first thing he would have said would have been, they can't come into my house, 
because a, a man's home is his castle, was a classic English common law um, uh, uh, principle. And then the second thing would have been, and they can't read my mail. They can't read my private correspondence. Fast forward to today, or, or fast forward to 1986, which is the dawn of the computer era. I mean, think about where you were in 1986 and the power of the computers. Email was, was still really in the future. And uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act was written at a time when the idea of actually storing email was impossible. It would be delivered, you'd read it, and then it would disappear. Um, so Congress, uh, not you know, not with any bad intent, but simply because of a lack of, of the ability to predict the future, which all of us share, uh, simply didn't come to understand that Gmail and, uh, and, uh, and other uh, cloud-based mail services would become the post office of the future, and that we would now communicate more in our private letters through electronic means than we do through paper and pen. And so uh, the equivalent of uh, what we're looking at today is a search of the desk in your house where you keep your personal love letters from your husband or wife or, or your, your, the personal mail from your daughter or your father or your mother. Uh, and, but now, instead of storing them in my desk, I store them uh, in the cloud on Gmail or with Microsoft or with uh, Yahoo or any one of the other dozens of service providers. Uh, what uh, the bill uh, the congressman has introduced is talking about is simply taking, I think, the traditional understanding of exactly what the founders would have thought was the core of their protected liberty, the protection against the, the warrantless examination of the content of their personal communications, and translating it to a time today when the place and the way and the form in which I store them is different but the nature of what is in them is exactly the same. Uh, and so that's the kind of constitutional transition from the Fourth Amendment to 1986, which, you know, the, the Mac was just two years old, right, to today. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask one more question, and we'll open it up. Katie, can you, you've been working on the coalition on this, uh, on, on this issue for quite some time. And what struck me about the, this coalition is it is strange bedfellows, to say the least. Um, but I think that, that that says something about the, you know, the power of the issue. Can you talk about, um, talk about the coalition members, talk about the dynamics of the coalition, talk about where you see this going, what the chances for passage are, et cetera? Sure, so there's, um, there are a few different coalitions that are very supportive of this. Um, I'm a member of both Digital Due Process and Digital Fourth, and Digital Fourth, along with Heritage, um, American Civil Liberties Union, and Center for Democracy and Technology, we're all working together very actively to move this forward because the Fourth Amendment is something that everyone can support. You're talking about domestic law enforcement, going in to your service provider with a subpoena so they can read your email without your knowledge. They would have to come to you with a warrant. We think they should also have to come to your service provider with a warrant with your knowledge so that you can find out what is privileged and what's not so that you can go through the process. This is something that doesn't, doesn't impede law enforcement's ability to do their job which is something that's also very important, which is why you know, we all support this. Um, for passage, it should be very simple, right? We're all concerned with privacy. There have been a few other things going on and electronic communications privacy reform. Common sense, it's something that should be easy to pass right now. But for some reason, the SEC and other civil, um, civil agencies, investigative agencies, think that they should be able to read your emails. And that is what is holding this back. They came forward and they said, wait, wait, wait. We're a civil investigative agency, the SEC says this. And if you change ECA, then we can't read people's emails anymore. And we kind of want to be able to do that. Um, there's really not an instance that I can think of very easily where there would be a civil investigation that was I mean, so important that there wasn't a criminal investigation going alongside it, where they couldn't leverage some kind of warrant need. 
So this is kind of an outlandish thing that if it were to pass with any kind of amendment that would allow the SEC or any other agency, you name it, um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, EPA, you just, it goes on and on and on, FTC, FCC. You know, they would all want a piece of the pie, and that would actually weaken where we stand right now. So we would be backtracking with any kind of amendment like that. And the coalition has been working very hard to keep this out because if that kind of amendment is added, then, I mean, what's the point? Good. Thank you. Okay, we'll open it up to questions. Right here. As a firm believer in, in the Fourth Amendment, um, trying to understand the government's position as to why they need this information, uh, has there been any discussion about, you know, there is software technology out there that could be uh, used by the separate uh, service providers that could uh, essentially index the metadata and keep it in, you know, essentially 20 or 30 silos rather than the government's argument of having all haystacks in one location under government control. Has there been any discussion about this kind of technology or keeping the metadata with the service providers and, and only being granted uh, that sliver of information when a warrant is issued? Well, that's, that's a little bit different when you're talking about metadata versus content and not to go down the rabbit hole on this, but metadata is often used to build, the, build a case to get to the content. Um, if we're going to talk about metadata, there should be a discussion as to what metadata actually is and what should constitute that, whether a web address or who is sending who what at what time. You know, who's sending who what at what time, I, you know, what's the problem in seeing that? That's how you build a case to get to the content. But the content is really what we're talking about here. And being able to subpoena the service provider for the content without the target's knowledge, that's the major problem. Well, they don't have that with electronic communications privacy, with the way that this is where, and when we're talking about domestic, um, domestic law enforcement and them building cases and how they get to that, they don't have huge stacks of data somewhere that they go tap into. We have another question over here. Hi, um, I script my notes, otherwise I don't remember them. Two points and then a larger comment. One, people re need to remember that the service providers are private companies who are already abusing our metadata. Two is the issue of aliases. I think it's a word that's gotta be brought up into any act addressing communications and privacy. Our aliases are our Twitter handles our um, email names, et cetera. My greater point is, Congressman, I'm not hearing your bill address the underground activism funded by the State Department that started under Hillary Clinton. She's been, state's been quite public that they're funding with millions of dollars underground groups like Tor, who then steal the identities, uh, the ISP identities of people domestically unknowingly their identity has been stolen when they cross a site and then an underground volunteer of this daisy chain that's been established takes that person's identity overseas probably even to locations like Benghazi that are used then to spark unrest. So the identity of the overseas activist actually is someone possibly in Wisconsin. So I think as you're discussing the electronic communications of what goes on with the NSA the, the reach would benefit with what state is doing quite actively. Otherwise, they're working against what you're trying to accomplish, in my estimation. Is it on? Okay, good. Um, I think what we've found uh, in actually moving legislation uh, here on the Hill that we do things in a step-by-step -step process. I'm actually sponsoring or co-sponsoring what I would consider to be many uh, pieces of Fourth Amendment type legislation. Uh, we also have uh, a fix on uh, the Patriot Act uh, that I've co-sponsored as well, uh, the Liberty Act uh, that I'm co-sponsoring as well. And so um, 
the more we try to address in one bill, the less its chances of passage. We almost have to take it on a step by step. This bill uh, was introduced after the IRS uh, said that uh, uh, because of the 180 day rule, uh, that after 180 day rules, uh, emails were fair game and they didn't need warrants to go in. My bill revokes that. Uh, 180, uh, 180 day uh, uh, rule and also requires that they get warrants for any. Uh, but I think the more specific we get on a piece by piece approach, the more likely we're going to be able to get it done. Uh, we find that omnibus legislation, uh, generally speaking, where you throw everything in in the Christmas tree, especially on something like this, probably wouldn't stand a very good chance at passage. Right here. The tech industry is very much interested in uh, maintaining uh, the privacy of its consumers. That's a promise that they want to make. Um, and they've been wounded in terms of their uh, business model by uh, suggestions that they are uh, subject to uh, government uh, uh, compulsion uh, to give away the private information of their own, uh, of their customers. They are therefore uh, large members of the, the coalitions that, that Katie was talking about and broadly support the idea that government access to the data that they hold on your behalf uh, should be limited uh, to the maximum extent that is consistent with good law enforcement practices. I mean, they're, they're not trying to sit behind walls and, and say the government has no role, but, uh, but broadly speaking, uh, the, I guess it's not the digital fourth, but the other one, right? Uh, digital due process. Yeah, has uh, like 100 you know, tech members of, of every way, manner, shape, and form. Digital fourth is limited to four, um, four activist. activist groups here in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the district um, that are kind of more political driver types, I guess, including Heritage Action. Down at the end there, that's right. Uh, so, so yeah, I think the the b basic answer is is that in, in terms of privacy and support of individual privacy against government intrusion, the tech companies are pretty much on board with everything that's happening. Right down here. But the fact that they have this information, um, Paul, you use as an example the post office and the carrier. They did not go into our mail or scan it. So is there something, Congressman, in your bill that mandates that the private company cannot share that information? You're talking now about uh, them having to be subpoenaed to give up the information, but what if they want to voluntarily give it up? Under the legislation that we're proposing, that information cannot go to a government agency without a warrant. Right. I'm sorry, to a publisher? They, they have contractual obligations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you, when you sign up with Google, they, or, or Yahoo, or Microsoft, I mean, I don't want to pick Google, it's just the easiest name to pick. Um, you know, you, you have uh, terms of service that you've agreed to that both authorize them to use your personal information in some ways and prohibit them in, from using it in others. There are, of course, it, it's a completely separate issue that a lot of consumer advocates are talking about, mm -hmm. about whether Google should be, and Microsoft and Yahoo, should be able to use your information in, in some of the ways that, they, that you've agreed to. But that's, you know, that's kind of a private sector con contractual problem, uh, where what we're concerned about here is really the far um, more troubling possibility of, of governmental abuse. Yeah, and, and, and the Constitution is clear uh, when it comes to the government seizing that kind of information, private uh, interchanges are, as uh, he mentioned, through contractual uh, relationships. Yeah, we're dealing with, you know, kind of three different layers here. I mean, there's domestic law enforcement privacy, there's the privacy concerns that you have contractually with yourself in a business, and then there's also kind of, you know, 
with things that have been going on, there's international, there's FISA. And so these are all under different regimes. And what the Congressman's Bill does is protects our domestic communications, right. our law enforcement, so that a warrant is needed for your email, just like for your letters. So you can't subpoena the postman and to get my letters without my knowledge. You have to come directly to me. And so that's really, that's very important. It should be a very easy, common sense reform. There was a petition that over 100,000 people signed for the White House. The president has not responded. <laughs> you know, this is something that's easy for Congress, for the administration to show that they care about privacy while dealing with more complicated issues. This is an easy step, and they're stalling it because agencies still want to be able to read your email without your knowledge. It's crazy. It's really, that's, that's just what it is. Th this doesn't apply to foreign nationals either, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, and foreign mm -hmm. governments. Uh, they are not protected under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights strictly uh, deals with American citizens. Mm -hmm. We Right down here in front, Jerry. And just before you go, Jerry, I've been asked to let folks know that if you're trying to get on the Wi-Fi, the password's Benjamin Harrison, all one word, capital B, capital H, okay? <laughs> Jerry. Good morning. Glad I came today. I'm learning some new things. Uh, Metadata, uh, I think, is a separate thing from, from what you're talking about. I was unaware that there were a number of units or elements of the federal government that could actually read my emails. And I think I heard that correctly, that mm -hmm. there are. So under what authority are they doing this, or have they been doing this, and how long have they been doing it? The authority generally for the administrative agencies, the IRS, the SEC, EPA, OSHA, I mean, every alphabet soup that you want has um, uh, a civil investigative authority to examine the violations of the OSHA regulations or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that has generally been construed to authorize them to make investigative demands of, uh, of your uh, service provider for the contents of the email. A, a typical thing that the SEC would say I mean, I, I don't buy this, but this is their argument, is, um, you know, we're investigating complex financial frauds in the banks uh, uh, or, in the, uh, or in the stock market, and we need to, you know, get the insider emails that, that do the inside trading, and that's all communications, and we should be able to get that. Because the Electronic Communications Privacy Act mm -hmm. from 1986 essentially says that you have no privacy interest in any mail that is stored on your server for longer than six months, which is a lot of mail, right? Google, um, then because Congress hasn't carved that out uh, or has, has excluded that from protection, the SEC, using its generic authority, uh, investigative authority, can go to your service provider, Microsoft, Yahoo, and say, here's an administrative subpoena. Please provide me all of Jerry's email. And the service provider is currently legally obliged to do that, to, to, to answer that, just as it would respond to a grand jury subpoena if you were under criminal investigation in the exact same way. The virtue of the congressman's bill it revokes was, that. Would, would be to revoke that. Right. The, and, and, and so your question is, how long have they been able to do it? They were empowered to do it uh, since the 1986 Electronic Communications Privacy Act. We're trying to amend that act to say that they can't do that, that if they want to get your email or your private uh, uh, electronic communications, they have to have a warrant. So probable cause relative to any specific individual has no place here. It's not needed. Well, probable cause not with civil investigations. With criminal investigations, yes. And that's where metadata comes in to build a case, and then you build a probable cause case to get to the content. But with civil investigations, that's a that's a completely different track. And it's hard to think of an instance where the SEC is going through a case, as you know I said, where it wouldn't also be criminal. So they don't need this particular authority. And also if you're dealing with a business or an individual within a business and it's internal email, you can go to the company and request that information. So I can't think of a situation where they would actually need this. Something they've brought up is, you know, those who are deceased or something along those lines, but they can issue a preservation order to service providers until they can work through those issues. So there's not really a case where they need 
broad access to your email. It's just there's too much paperwork. It's actually um, a useful historical point that it's, it goes back to the late 1800s that the court said that the probable cause requirement, the Supreme Court said the probable cause requirement would not apply to civil investigative demands, even if that information might eventually be passed along to the criminal uh, investigators. So it, the, the purpose for which the demand is made at the time, assuming it's not a fraud and that there's a legitimate, the court said, we will permit civil investigative authorities uh, to act uh, without the probable cause requirement, which applies only in the criminal context. And so that's, uh, that's a very old, probably changed view, you know, in, incorrect view, but I can't undo everything. <laughs> <laughs> right here, and then we'll go there. This wouldn't address that, uh, the Obamacare. This is specifically addressing uh, the 1986 law that uh, uh, basically allows government agencies to come in and get emails. Um, this is very, very, very targeted. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a broad swath of uh, uh, what I'd call uh, Fourth Amendment issue uh, pieces of legislation. I've co-sponsored <coughs> many of them. Uh, and uh, there is one uh, being drafted, I can't remember the bill number, that specifically addresses this. Actually, it has been drafted, and I'm a co-sponsor of that as well. Great. Up, up here. Hi. To the chap from Heritage, I think you owe everybody to explain that the toss or terms of service are moving targets. If someone doesn't know when to go in to see if there's been a change, they're not going to know what the current terms of service is that they're bound to. And in terms of Obamacare, people are being tracked the second they, they come to the page. If you are talking to people who have gone to the page and not entered data, they're already reporting that they're getting hit with solicitations. And I think a prime example of what needs to be aware of is Facebook. Because Facebook is a great example of someone who came out way after the fact and then said, oh, by the way, everything you're giving us, has given us, is now ours to sell. And that they fail to disclose to people that the goal of their model was to capture data. I do paper trails. I am tracking data to foreign countries. I'm tra tracking algorithms of our data in England. I'm tracking things like Yatedo and Yumpu, who are taking our information. And these are French and German and Austrian foreign nationals who have our data. You can go onto your own website here, or uh, uh, internet here, and search your name and find out what's been disclosed of you. I think the conversation cannot just be focused in on one area. It's a model. I tend to draw things back to model, and I'd like to hear clarity when you go into your act that you're looking at the model. The same model that's being used by the NSA is the model that was established by these private entities who know everything about us, what we're doing, where our finances are, et cetera. Paul? Well, I mean, as, as the congressman said, um, there is no doubt that uh, commercial services use data as well. But uh, he, I think quite rightly, is uh, going in a step-by-step -step way. You know, if we had a, a large, I mean, the gentleman here asked whether or not the tech companies were supporting this legislation, to which the answer is yes. If you added in, they won't. Uh, yeah, if you <laughs> added in something that that started to talk about commercial issues and their business model, um, which are fair. I mean, your your points are very fair. I'm not disagreeing with your points, but in the art of the possible, um, you know, 
they, you know, right now there are, I don't know how many sponsors you all have and all, but in the Senate side they got, uh, you know, 52 or something like that. You know, we can actually make a change. Uh, and so I'm kind of focused on success in that. And it's kind of like not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh -huh. um, this, is, this legislation was not born out of uh, necessarily consumer protection. It's about civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about our relationship between us and our government and enforcing the Bill of Rights. Um, when you're dealing with private companies, and I, I agree, I, I think there are egregious things happening, and uh, companies are over, uh, private companies are overstepping their bounds. I, I, I hate the cookies. You mm -hmm. know, when you go check a site and then you get all these emails uh, and, and uh, uh, advertisements from different groups. Um, and that should be addressed as well. But this, we have to remember that we have to, uh, we're dealing with uh, a Fourth Amendment issue. And that's what we're trying to correct. And we're going to try to get it as one step of a time, at a time. Uh, you, you mentioned that politics makes strange bedfellows, and there are some strange bedfellows together on this kind of legislation, but the more you put into it, the more it complicates it, and the narrower right. that group of supporters is going to be, and the less likely that you're going to get anything done. Mm -hmm. This is something that I did want to ask you about, Congressman. Um, hey, you're working with a lot of folks in, on the libertarian side of, yeah. uh, of this position uh, in the House of Representatives. You have a Liberty Caucus that's forming, you know, guys like Justin Amash and others. Right. Um, and I know that there's a lot of focus in that group on these types of issues. Right. I also know that, you know, talked to you know, Chairman of the Study Committee the other day, Steve Scalise, who wants to put together some, some, some legislation on this kind of issue. What are the areas um, going forward that, uh, on top of the, the ECPA bill, that we should be starting to focus on? Some next stages. I, I think you're right about this being the low-hanging fruit. But where do we go after the low-hanging fruit? Well, this one is low-hanging fruit because... Um, it's a no-brainer. Everybody, everybody understands that uh, technology has changed, and this is the snail mail of, you know, of uh, of our time. This is how uh, communications are done. Um, I think, over and above uh, Fourth Amendment issues, mm -hmm. uh, religious liberty uh, is going to continue to be mm -hmm. an incredibly important issue to those of us that are civil libertarians and freedom of speech issues. Um, I think uh, uh, private property rights uh, is enshrined in the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution are going to be uh, something that we focus on. And let's not forget, uh, I think one of the most important ones that we will come back to time and time again uh, is the Tenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. And the fact that all powers not delineated uh, in the Constitution are reserved for the people and the states. And I think that's one uh, that uh, the general welfare clause in the Constitution that's been so overplayed and uh, uh, over uh, analyzed uh, to justify uh, doing things at the federal level that our founding fathers never would have envisioned being done here. And so that's just to name a few. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not all inclusive. Yep. I'm sure there's other things. But um, I think those are the things uh, that are going to not only be um, uh, a focus in Congress, but I think they're going to be campaign issues. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We have time for a couple more questions. Agreeing that your bill is a no-brainer, that it should pass, uh, what, is, what is your prediction? When will it pass, and who are the no-brainers in the Senate that won't support it? I don't know about, uh, you know, who, who is and isn't supporting it yet. Um, as, it's, as it's moving forward, it'll, it'll need to go before the Judiciary Committee. And, you know, my frustration, uh, I think, is the same as many of you in the audience and many in America uh, that we don't do anything of any substance in election years. That's a crime. I mean, we're elected to do the hard work of the American people. And, uh, you know, problems don't take a holiday. And we have a responsibility this year uh, to go in and dig deep. And I, I, I mean, I'm hoping this year. I'm not holding my breath. And there are a lot of no-brainers that have been on the docket for years and years and years that should have been done. Another no-brainer is why in the heck haven't we done anything about entitlement reform uh, knowing that our nation's going broke and there, there's no way we can cover fu future obligations for people that are going to be retiring. Um, but uh, I, I wish I could give you that, a that answer. It, it is very, very frustrating to me that what is clear to the American people uh, doesn't become necessarily so clear here. I wish I could give you a date and time, um, but uh, uh, I can't. 
Katie, do you want to weigh in a little bit there? Are there one or two things that could kind of break the log jam right now? Um, you know, if there are enough co-sponsors for this particular idea to go through, then it's something that can't be ignored. And there has been a large, large groundswell of support for electronic communications privacy reform in the House. I mean, this is an idea that is very much supported. And really, on the Senate side, it did pass out of committee um, without amendment, it passed out clean, and then once the hearings came up, that's when the SEC started to make their case and started to have meetings because they saw this passing. So, you know, it's something that really should go through and more support from people who care about this particular issue, who care about privacy, to focus on something that can get done right now without all of the other distractions. And, you know, those other things are very important. Um, there are other bills that are in the House right now that do address these. Um, there's a location tracking bill, which is another complicated issue that should pass, but there's a lot of discussion that needs to go on on certain, you know, certain areas, and that's almost worked out. But electronic communications privacy reform has been discussed. It has been worked out, and that's something that should move forward easily, and I think it has the strongest chance in the House. Mm -hmm. And once, once it's cleared, the Senate should have no reason not to act. And I think one other real shot in the arm to give a plug for Heritage is the fact that they're profiling it today uh, on a list of uh, 10 different issues uh, that they're going to make a priority. Heritage has quite a following uh, nationwide, and I'd like to put a plea uh, to all the folks that are associated with Heritage across the country uh, to let their members know, because the one thing that they actually do pay attention to uh, is people that vote or will not vote for them based on an issue, and I hope that they hear strongly uh, from uh, the American people that you have a job to do, get it done. And this is uh, one of the things that can and should be done this year uh, as part of your job. Thanks, thanks for the plug, Congressman. We are, uh, we are hopeful that today um, really is the start of a, an agenda that we can wrap our arms around as conservatives and push across the House floor. Um, so we'll, and we intend to push it with uh, all our muscle. Um, maybe one more question. Anyone? Right here. What do we have, Greg? About 30? Okay, great. Going once, going twice. Last one. Sorry, one last one. Hear, hearing that uh, so many federal agencies are getting access to our information, um, and that uh, from the lady behind me saying about how the service providers are, are possibly misusing our information for commercial purposes. Um, do you have a recommendation of a service provider who uh, is uh, least offensive? <laughs> Pass. Coming up here? Pass. So no way we're going to touch that one from up here. That's unfair. But if you talk to me offline, I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you my personal. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking the panel and the congressman. Uh, folks, just one housekeeping note, and then we will, um, uh, and then we'll break for ten minutes to get ready for the next uh, speaker and panel. Uh, we are, we've had uh, Senator Cruz uh, had some flight issues this morning, so we are going to move Senator Cruz's speech to one o'clock. Um, which means the health care panel will go before the health care speeches. So the health care panel will be around noon, uh, and then Congressmen Rowe and Price will speak after the health care panel at 1230, and then uh, Senator Ted Cruz will speak at 1 o'clock. Um, let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll bring in the next, uh, next uh, panel. Okay, folks, thank you. Let's, uh, let's uh, re-